When we first moved out of our one bedroom apartment and into our camper van full time, the plan was just for a short term adventure. I mean, sure, we hoped that the experience would be life changing in some general sense, but thinking back, we had no idea how profound of a transformation was about to occur. And so it was on July 1st, 2014, two weeks before our wedding day, that Paula and I moved our drastically reduced belongings into our new 63 square foot home and prepared to say our vows and then step off for a two month road trip across Canada. At the time, ditching our apartment was little more than a cost saving measure because we were trying to afford both a wedding and also an extended trip while still making regular payments on our sizable debt. So rent and utilities on an apartment that we wouldn't even be using for a couple of months was a pretty easy expense to cut. We'd just get a new apartment whenever we got back. But as many of you already know, somehow our two month honeymoon became two full years of full time van life and now almost another year of homesteading. So let's talk a little bit about exactly how that happened and more importantly, how it's influenced every single day of our lives since. The first leg of our journey kept us pretty close to home. We visited Toronto and Niagara Falls, North Bay, Sudbury. We'd already been to these places before, but we still had a pretty awesome time filled with new experiences. But then we hit Sault Ste. Marie and Wawa and Thunder Bay and officially traveled further than I'd ever been from home. It took three whole days just to travel across Ontario and it was long since dark by the time we made it to the Manitoba border. But then after some much needed rest in Falcon Lake, we continued on to Winnipeg, where we enjoyed some delicious vegan burgers, and then Portage La Prairie and Brandon, and eventually we crossed the 100th meridian, where the Great Plains begin. When we hit Saskatchewan, we ran into more mosquitoes than we'd ever thought possible. But we visited Regina and Moose Jaw and Rulo, or Dog River, as some of you may know it. Then it was up to Saskatoon for a few days to visit a couple of our best friends, who also just happened to be my cousin and her husband. Like us, she grew up back in Ontario, but he was from New Jersey. They fell in love as teenagers, but as soon as they were old enough, they got married and he left behind his entire life to create a new one here with her in Canada. They struggled financially for a few years, but they always remained one of the happiest couples I've ever met. Then one day, he found his dream job. It was great money, it was something he had always wanted to do, the only problem was that it was 3,000 kilometers away in Saskatchewan, but they never missed a beat. He had left everything he knew behind for her, and so she did the same thing for him. And that was like three years ago, and they're still as happy as ever. We hung out with them for a few days before getting back on the road, but as we were saying goodbye, I mentioned how it was so inspiring that they were able to just take chances like that and confidently go after whatever they wanted. They smiled and said something in reply, but unfortunately I couldn't quite hear it. But speaking about family, all along the way we'd been making regular phone calls home to let our loved ones know that we were okay and excitedly fill them in on all of our adventures. They were always super happy to hear from us and amazed by all the things that we'd seen and all the people that we'd met along the way. They couldn't believe how far we'd traveled and reminded us to enjoy it while it lasted, because eventually we'd have to turn around and come back to reality. Next, we stayed in our first ever Walmart in the peculiar little town of Lloydminster, which straddles the provincial border of Saskatchewan and Alberta. Then off to Edmonton, where we rode a roller coaster inside the West Edmonton Mall, and then Drumheller, where we climbed some hoodoos, and eventually Calgary for a couple of recovery days after having a little too much fun when visiting my stepbrother. We called home again when we made it to Banff National Park in the Rocky Mountains. And once again, they reminded us about the importance of enjoying it while it lasted, because eventually we'd have to come back to reality. Next, we traveled the Columbia Icefields Parkway, where we visited Lake Louise and spent a romantic night at the foot of a glacier. In Jasper, we paid for our only hotel room of the entire trip, but we knew it was worth it while we were soaking in a rooftop hot tub and enjoying drinks and stories with new friends from all over the world. After crossing the border into British Columbia, we headed for Kamloops to enjoy one of their nightly free concerts, followed by a sunset walk along the Thompson River. Then to Kelowna, where we spent the night camped out in an apple orchard. 
And then the next morning enjoyed breakfast and wonderful conversation with an electrical engineer who left it all behind to become an apple farmer. I shook his hand as we were saying goodbye and said that I wished we could do something like this. I've always loved the idea of getting my hands dirty and working with nature in such a calm and peaceful way. He responded as I climbed into the driver's seat of the van, but unfortunately I couldn't quite hear him. The next day we called home while enjoying some local wine overlooking the Okanagan Valley. And after the usual excited stories and happy reactions, we were once again reminded of our eventual return back to reality. When we finally made it to Vancouver on Canada's west coast, we stayed with some more cousins. But these ones we barely knew, and yet we'd never felt more at home. All of their friends were in their early 20s, had piercings and multicolored hair. They made their living by planting trees in northern BC and Alberta, and enthusiastically shared everything that they had. Their house was absolutely filled with people, and when we asked them how many roommates they had, they simply shrugged. They had no idea, because it changed on a daily basis. They lived in what some would call a rough part of town, and yet they never locked their doors, and always welcomed anyone who just needed a place to stay, or food to eat, or even just a place to do some laundry. They took us on a walking tour of their part of town. We had drinks in one of their favorite spots, and even visited their local free library, where other generous people left their old books that they'd finished reading, in hopes that someone else might find some joy in them. They walked us to the van as we were preparing to leave, and as I gave them a hug, I told them that their carefree lifestyle and open hospitality was infectious. I just wished that we could live life as fully as they did. They whispered something before they let me go. I knew it was important, and I tried to replay the words in my head as we drove away, but I just couldn't. On our last day in Vancouver, we toured Stanley Park. We stepped inside a hollow tree. We crossed a crowded suspension bridge and even enjoyed some time at the beach. We went for a swim, met some artists, talked to some like-minded tourists, and eventually settled down in another Walmart for some much needed rest. That night while Paula made dinner, I wrote a postcard to my father to let him know that I was finally starting to get it. You see, he'd hitchhiked across Canada as a teenager and then spent most of my childhood regaling me with stories of his adventures. My father very much shared our current wanderlust and was so proud of us for taking such an adventure at the beginning of our marriage. Yet even he expressed a similar sentiment when we called home. That eventually the fun would have to end and we'd have to come back to reality. The next morning, we took the ferry to Vancouver Island. We watched buskers in Victoria. We explored a floating tiny house community, and we watched the sunset while touring the harbor in a water taxi. The next day, we drove the gorgeous winding roads up to Tofino, one of the only surfing communities in all of Canada. We took a whale watching tour to see orcas and sea lions, and then another quick stop at the beach. One of my personal goals was to swim in all three oceans that border our country, and the Pacific waters of Tofino seemed like the perfect place to start. Though in hindsight, I probably should have paid a little more attention to the fact that all the surfers were wearing wetsuits. It was freezing, but worth it. That night we visited more extended family in Nanaimo, and then explored the 800-year-old Douglas firs in Cathedral Grove, one of the few remaining old-growth forests in the entire world. These trees represent an endangered link to our not-so-distant past, before European colonization and the ravages of the logging industry. They're a perfect example of how progress isn't always positive. We eventually left the island on another ferry, but this time headed north, up the west coast of BC to Prince Rupert. The voyage took like 16 hours, but it was a perfect opportunity to catch up on some sleep and let someone else drive for a change. But it wasn't only about the rest, because in every direction the views were absolutely breathtaking. I chatted with a photographer from France who was equally amazed by the fantastic scenery as he was by the fact that I was still in shorts and a t-shirt, despite the relatively cool temperatures. Well, you're obviously Canadian, he said with a laugh. Asked where he was headed, but he said he had no idea. He went on to explain that his life is all about the delicate balance between taking photos and letting the photos take him wherever they wanted. 
I told him that I've always loved photography. It was one of my favorite hobbies. How wonderful it would be traveling the world, making a living by selling my art. It felt like deja vu when he replied. There was something in his expression that seemed familiar. I watched his mouth as he spoke and I knew that I needed to pay attention to what he was saying, but I just couldn't. It seemed like an invitation, but then somebody yelled about seeing a whale off the side of the boat and he ran off to take a photo before I could ask him to repeat it. When we finally reached the mainland, we stopped in Terrace for some extra gas cans because the next leg of our journey was going to take us much further north where modern conveniences are far less convenient. It was another two or three days of wandering in and out of the mountains before we reached Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory. And then a couple more days of driving through the remote northern wilderness before we came upon Pelly Crossing, where we picked up an Aboriginal man named Danny. A fascinating character whose inspirational story we've documented in another video. If you haven't already, we highly recommend that you check it out. He was hitchhiking to Dawson City, home of the legendary Klondike Gold Rush, and we are forever grateful that we gave him a lift. Once in Dawson, we found a place to camp out for the night, and then panned for some gold, had a sour toke cocktail, and even made friends with an energetic army veteran in his 90s at the Diamond Tooth Gertie's Nightly Cabaret Show. After buying us around, he explained that he makes the week-long journey there from Vancouver every single year just to see the girls dance. We called home in the morning and after the usual catching up, we received the usual reminder about coming back to reality. But this time something seemed different. We couldn't quite figure it out, but the now familiar words seemed less like a reminder and more like a warning. The final leg of our journey took us even further north, from Dawson City up the Dempster Highway, a 737 single lane gravel highway to Inuvik, the furthest north that you can drive to in all of Canada. Along the way, we spent a night at Tombstone Territorial Park, passed through Danny's hometown of Sigachik, and even officially crossed the Arctic Circle. When we arrived in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, we were absolutely amazed. Most inhabitants are members of the Inuvialuit or Gwich'in First Nations, and their ancestors have lived in that area for hundreds of years. We visited their community greenhouse and their igloo-shaped church. We picked up some groceries at their northern store, marveled at their colorful houses, and interacted with as many locals as we could. Next, we left our van behind for the first time since we left home and boarded a small four-seater airplane for a 45-minute flight over the spectacular Mackenzie Delta, all the way to Tukta Yuktuk on the coast of the Arctic Ocean. While there, our tour guide showed us around the community. We checked out some pretty amazing pingos, explored their underground refrigerator dug deep into the permafrost, and even crossed another goal off my list with a quick swim in the Arctic Ocean. Life in Tuck, as it's commonly called, was about as foreign to us as anything we could imagine. It seemed so primitive and extreme to our standards, and yet everyone we met seemed so happy and fulfilled. The locals were quiet, but everyone we encountered were friendly and polite. There were no tall buildings, no rush hour, no morning commute. The streets were not bustling with office workers too busy trying to get on with their day to even notice that you were there. They were all just normal people, living their lives close to nature and surrounded by friends and family. It was after 11 p.m. by the time we got back to Inuvik and returned to our van. And yet, kids were still playing soccer in the fields and everyone was just walking around in full daylight like it was the middle of the day. By 12, we found a place to camp for the night and took a photo of the midnight sun. It eventually dipped below the horizon, but it was still pretty bright outside by 2 a.m. when we finally decided to call it a night. The next morning, we called home one last time before turning the van around and heading back south. We knew we wouldn't have any cell phone reception for the next several days, so we spent a little extra time on the phone. And as usual, we excitedly relayed everything that we'd experienced, followed by the usual reply about enjoying it while it lasted, because eventually we'd have to come back to reality. But this time, we began to notice some subtle cracks in that advice. Because though we couldn't quite explain it, we suddenly came to the realization that the further we traveled from home, the closer to reality we felt. As we pulled back onto the Dempster Highway and began traveling south, we were overcome with a sense of accomplishment. Not only did we make it all the way to the west coast, but we'd even officially crossed the Arctic Circle. We were literally on top of the world. 
This proud glow followed us the entire day. It was late afternoon by the time that we ascended the Peel Plateau near Eagle Plains, the only gas station before returning to Dawson City. The elevation change was so dramatic that we were quickly overtaken by dense, low-lying clouds. As we slowed our pace to make up for the decrease in visibility, we suddenly came upon two silhouettes in the distance. It was difficult to tell at first, but we eventually realized that they were two cyclists, walking their bikes south one several minutes in front of the other. We waved as we passed the first, but noting her exhausted expression, we stopped at the second and asked if they needed any help. The gentleman said that they were just taking it easy because that last hill was quite the climb. He said that he was pushing ahead while his wife rested to try and see if there was a place to camp out for the night on the side of the road. We offered them a lift, but he politely declined, saying that they intended to travel only by their own power. Intrigued, we hopped out of the van and asked where they were headed. By this time, his wife had caught up and after some brief introductions, they told us their story. Turns out that they were both successful people from Vancouver who'd grown dissatisfied with the usual rat race. So one day they quit their jobs and sold their condo. Then using the profits from the sale, they bought some bikes, some camping gear, and two one-way tickets to Inuvik. After deboarding the plane and checking out the sites, they hopped on their bikes and started cycling back south. We were absolutely amazed by their courage and excitedly asked them how far they were planning to go. And the husband grinned and simply said, Argentina. I was flabbergasted. How long do you expect that to take, I asked. Oh, about two or three years at this pace, he chuckled. But we don't really have any set plans. My goodness, I said, that sounds amazing. I would love to do something like that. And you know what he said in response? It was only four simple words, but we were finally ready to hear it. He said, so why don't you? And that was the turning point. That was the moment where everything changed for us. Our cross Canada journey was far from over. We eventually made it back south and then out to the east coast. I even accomplished my goal of swimming in all three oceans. We experienced many more amazing things and we'll tell you all about them in time. But from that point on, we stopped listening to the people who said that we need to get back to reality and started listening to the people who were already there. We started hearing them when they invited us to join them. The invitation was only four simple words and people had been saying it to us the entire time. But we just weren't ready to hear it. You see, life is extremely short, but it has so much to offer us. There are so many wonderful places to see and adventures to have. So why don't you? Well, I think it's because for most of us, we've been conditioned to believe that reality is waking up every morning, leaving your family behind, and then spending all day doing a job that you hate. Reality means watching the clock, wasting away the hours of your life, hoping that you still have just enough energy at the end of the day to spend a few minutes talking to your loved ones before falling asleep in front of the TV. It means putting off the things that you actually want to do with your life until the weekend or the summer or retirement, only to discover that you're now too tired or too busy or too old to enjoy them. Reality means that many children who grow up in large cities never even see the stars in the night sky because the artificial streetlights are too bright. It means gradually realizing that the dreams and goals of your youth will likely go unfulfilled. Reality means going to the grocery store to buy truck ripened fruit from thousands of miles away, even though your neighbor has an apple tree in their backyard. But you've just always been too busy to introduce yourself. Reality means buying bigger houses, fancier cars, and trendier wardrobes just to impress people that we don't know or don't even like. It means that corporate greed overrules our social well-being so that our tax dollars go to fund foreign wars and dirty fuels and unsustainable policies instead of housing the homeless or feeding the hungry or comforting the sick. But here's the thing. Just because we've been told that this is the only way to live in reality doesn't mean that it's true. If there's one thing that two years of full-time van life has taught us is that all of this is just a facade. It's a veneer. It's social pressures slowly 
pulling the wool over your eyes. But we don't have to accept their definition of reality. There's more to life. We've seen it. Now, we're not crazy. We know that we can't all just quit our jobs or buy an orchard or start traveling the world overnight. I mean, heck, we've been at this for like three years now and we're still just trying to figure it out. But there are many things that we can do to slowly pull back that wool, peel off the veneer, and break down the facade. And this is why we've chosen to rename our channel. We're no longer just a guy, a girl, and a camper van. We're on a mission. We're gonna do our best to explore a more sustainable future. We're gonna figure out how to get back to basics, back to nature, and back to reality. And we sincerely hope that you'll join us.